It's still great to be here. And um, I wanted to sort of pose a question at the beginning that hopefully we'll, we'll think through during the course of my talk. Um, and the question is, do women become bad wives and unpleasant partners when they have not only a room of their own, but an income of their own? And in the event that their income exceeds that of their partner, do they become even more um, domineering and unpleasant. And while this might seem sort of a laughable notion, um, we can actually see bits and pieces of it in the, in the current TV series, uh, TV season, which is kind of obsessed with the decline of men and the, and the scary rise of women. But it was really, <laughs> it was really accepted as, as fact for, hundreds of years, and I think it's easy to forget that for hundreds of years in this country and in the UK and other countries, it was so important, it was considered so important for women to be economically disempowered in marriage that legally women were forbidden once they got married from owning property or from owning the right to their own wages. Um, essentially, legally, women ceased to exist when they got married under English common law and also here, which meant that they, they couldn't be sued by creditors, they couldn't prosecute contracts, but they also couldn't own their own property. And um, this was considered so important to uh, social stability that uh, in the late 19th century, when people were starting to talk about the idea that maybe it wasn't the best way for marriage to be ordered, um, the London Times found the idea so threatening that they published a very, very long editorial about why it was so important that women not have any property rights in marriage or even the right to their own earnings. Um, and when I was doing the research for my book, I went back and read the editorial, and it, it's really very, very long, tortured argument about why it's so important for women to be disempowered. But looking at there, there was a proposal in Parliament that, that maybe the law should be changed, and the paper wrote that the proposed change would totally destroy the existing relation between husband and wife which at present consists of authority on the one side and subordination on the other. It would be an enormous change that impacts the whole character of the marriage relation. And they went on to say, apparently one of the reasons why it was considered possibly a good idea was because for poor women who were working and earning, if they were, if they were married to a man, in the words of the paper, who was um, vicious, reckless, uh, improvident or drunk, and they went on and on and on. It was obviously a bad thing that she had to hand her earnings over to him, and, and maybe you know it would be good if she could hang on to them so that they wouldn't be, I guess, drunk away. But on the other hand, they felt that among the well-conducted poor, uh, that it would annihilate the marriage bond if the woman could have the right to her own earnings. And among the wealthy, they felt that it would completely destroy marriage as as, as it was known, um, and they went on to write that uh, at present, um, it is absolutely requisite to the peace of the family and to the happiness of all the members of it that the authority of the husband and the subordination of the wife and children should be decidedly maintained, and it is impossible to suppose that this could be the case if husband and wife were not only before but after marriage independent contracting parties in which case marriage becomes, quote, a mere cohabitation of independent agents for special purposes. The family would lose its unity and the basis of our whole social life would be destroyed if women could own their own wages. And, and interestingly, they, in the course of making this argument, they point out that for many married women who were wealthy, there was um, something called a settlement in which I guess her property could sort of be legally tied up and trustees would make decisions about what happened to, with her property. And so she couldn't, her husband couldn't actually sell it, um, but she couldn't make decisions on it either, but at least it would be protected. And one of the sort of specious arguments that they come up with as to why they shouldn't change the law is if the woman could control her own property rather than the trustees, she might give it all to her husband and then he might piss it away and then her children would lose out. So sort of, um, you know, lose-lose for her either way. But what I thought was really interesting is they also point out that even when a wife's property is tied up in a settlement, it's a bad thing if it exceeds that of her husband. And so smart trustees will make sure that whatever property she has would be 
inferior to that of her husband because if a property, if the wife has more property than her husband, whenever the property of the wife is superior, she is too apt to set herself up as the benefactor and either to make a parade of her bounty toward the man she is married to or to complain that he is living upon her. So the idea that, you know, first of all, that if, um, it, that a woman shouldn't have earnings, but even if she had this property to decide, if it exceeded that of her husband, it would make her unpleasant and a bad wife. And she would be just either bragging about it all the time or making him feel bad or complaining that, um, that he was a freeloader. And they, they conclude by saying that, uh, the possession of property is the practical instrument by which moral superiority is asserted. If a woman has her own property and can apply to her separate use her own earnings, she is practically emancipated from her husband's control. What is to prevent her from going where she likes and doing what she pleases? <laughs> And, and actually, the answer to the, interestingly enough, two years after this editorial was written, they did pass a Married Woman's Property Act in England, and the same thing was happening in this country. Women would get the right to their property, they would get the right to their children, the custody of their children in the case of divorce, which up until then they had not necessarily had, and that eventually, of course, they would get the vote. Um, but what's interesting is this notion that marriage depends on the economic dependence of the wife and would cease to exist if, if they became independent contracting parties persisted. And even into the early 20th century, as we were moving from, you know, uh, sort of a society based, at least for the wealthy on property rights, to a wage earning society, this notion that, that marriage depended on a husband who was bringing in income and a wife who was dependent persisted. And so even during the Industrial Revolution and into the early 20th century, there were, I think, more barriers maybe than we realize to, to suppress women's earning when they did earn. Um, we think of the Industrial Revolution as being a time when jobs were really sort of men's jobs. They were difficult labor, heavy labor jobs. But in fact, as, as, as manufacturing expanded and offices and retail expanded, there were a lot of jobs that could be done by women. So they instituted things like marriage bars so that when a woman got married, she would actually lose her job um, or not be fired. Uh, they had, you know, two-tier wage systems. There were certain jobs that were men jobs. There were certain jobs that were female jobs. Women were paid less. Uh, during the Depression, when WPA was employing people, a woman would make $3 a day. A man or a boy would make $5 a day. So it was just accepted that men should make more than women because men were the breadwinners. Um, and, and, and the idea persisted that if a woman um, that that if a woman were to have too much money, she would become she would become unpleasant, and and so you would see even in the 1920s, um, social commentators saying things like, um, a wife who has her own income is a poorer wife. Uh, she becomes more critical, less lenient to his faults and failings. Uh, now, what's interesting, this was a letter that was written to a periodical in the 1920s. When I was doing the final fact-checking on my book and I was going back and checking everything, I had assumed that that letter was written by a man. That letter was written by a woman. Uh, so that the interesting this this notion that she's gonna she's gonna become domineering and critical if she if she makes her own money. Now there was a, a male uh, social commentator who said also in the 1920s that when a wife earns her own living, diminishing masculine authority follows. So again, persistent notion that um, that a woman shouldn't have earnings, and also uh, the notion in the 20s and 30s that a man needed to be the breadwinner because it kept him sort of stable and sober. And so you also see that written that, you know, that if, that as long as he has this kind of incentive to provide for a wife and family, his behavior is going to be uh, more steady than if he's, than if he doesn't have that wage earning pressure. And so we see this idea in the, you know, in the, in the 1950s, um, you know, it's still a case where women face enough barriers in the workplace that it is difficult for them to 
often to support themselves or support a family. And so this notion arises that this is the way marriage must always be and that marriage is a kind of a bargain where the man is bringing something to it, namely earnings, and the woman is bringing different things. It could be um, domestic services. It could be beauty uh, that, you know, she looks good on his arm, so it's good for him professionally, or she brings sexual services or whatever. But it's this deal. And in the 1950s, Simone de Beauvoir wrote about that. She writes about the deal, this deal that women have bought into that that they're going to be supported and provided by a man in marriage and that he is therefore going to have authority in the household. And then later on in the century, you also have evolutionary biologists arguing that this is the natural state of things, that this is the way it's always been, um, you know, back to our Neanderthal roots, that, that a woman is always looking for a man who can be the hunter, who can be the provider, and that, you know, women are genetically driven to want to be in a provider relationship a relationship with a provider and and so the idea that this is inevitable um or or that that this is um that this is the trade that men and women make when they marry persists and so what's so interesting is that we're now in this really unprecedented time period where thanks in part to you know the struggles that that women's rights advocates have made over the past 30 or 40 years, we're looking at a situation where women now are 50%, 57% of college and university students in the United States, now that barriers uh, to women's education have, have dropped and, and, and college campuses has, have opened up, and a whole new set of incentives is in place for women to go to college. Um, we know that the earnings are showing up to the point where in most American cities now, uh, young women, single women under 30, out earn their male peers, uh, not only in large cities, but in most American cities now. Uh, we know, and this is a really surprising statistic that I think um, most people don't anticipate, that in marriage, almost 40% of working wives out earn their husbands. And this is a percentage that has been steadily rising since the late 1980s when the government started tracking it. It's interesting to me that the government does track it, that, they, that they, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has a table for wives out earning husbands, presumably because it was considered sort of freakish enough in the 1980s that they thought maybe we should track it. But what you see, what you see when you look at that table is that it has been steadily rising. It was, I think, 23.7 in 1987, and it's now um, just about 38 percent. It's been there was a an acceleration at the beginning of this millennium in in 2000 2001. It started going up. So before the recession, the recession definitely accelerated it further, but it was happening before that. Uh, and so um, economists I've talked to believe that it is this education advantage showing up. And and if you track it, if you just look at the pace of change and you track it and you plot it out, you would see that in 2030. Um, a majority of working wives would out earn their husbands. And at the same time, we've had, um, we've had a, an explosion of single parenthood, and we know now that 40% of children are born to unmarried mothers, and, and that too has been going up. So again, around the same time, we could be looking at a society where among mothers, a majority of mothers are supporting households. If you look at women raising children alone and also mothers out earning fathers, we could be looking at you know, a society of female breadwinners. And, and in a way, I would argue that the London Times, wrong as it was in many ways, was right in the sense that economic empowerment really does change incentives to marry. It, it, it introduces incentives to not marry, um, and that all that that many of the trends we're seeing in terms of marriage formation really do have to do with women's increasing economic empowerment and the, and, and the fact that if they want to live on their own, they can now. Um, and, and so I'll talk about, I, but the question of whether, of whether when women do out-earn their partners, which is something we can assume will be happening more and more, whether they therefore become unpleasant is, I think, <laughs> an interesting question to ponder. And, and I did think about this as I was doing my reporting, because I think when you read about this, 
often the idea that you know this image of a woman who she's like she's in a suit and she's in her office and she's got her husband on speakerphone and she's barking orders at him because he's at home and she thinks he's incompetent and this you know and again this cultural idea that that men at home are, are somehow incompetent um, persists and so I think the idea of the economically empowered woman as unpleasant or shrewish. Um, does persist, I think, in in our culture, even as the idea of the man at home as hapless also persists in our culture. And I think, you know, it's a much more complicated situation. And I interviewed lots of people from my book in situations where women are out earning their husbands or out earning their potential partners. And one thing that you do see, I'll just talk about. I think that all sorts of questions that feminism thought had been resolved are now being reopened. And for example, I interviewed a woman named Rose who is in her early 30s, and she works in the aerospace industry, actually in Northern California. And she's well educated. She went to a prestigious、um, school on the East Coast. She joined the Freedom from Gender Society.、Uh, Uh, you know, very progressive. Just abolish all gender stereotypes. Move into a world where we're all equal. She married an equally educated husband, and he he、um, was working in the IT field. But he went back to get his master's at the very beginning of the recession. So when he emerged with his master's, there were no jobs, and he was unemployed for a couple of years. And she found herself. Asking a lot of questions that the Freedom from Gender Society had not prepared her for,、um, and one of them was, you know, I, I think feminism has really raised us to expect equality and 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 equality and parity. That in an ideal world, we'll make exactly the same amount of money, we'll all work the same number of hours in the workplace, there'll be reasonable hours that will allow us to come home and tend to our children, and we will work the exact same numbers of housework amount of housework at home.、And、so that's the world that we had envisioned. I Think in the freedom from gender society world, and and so what she found was as she she now feeling the pressure of being a breadwinner. Actually, they ended up they they were going to wait to get married until they could afford a big enough wedding that they can invite all their friends to. But he needed health insurance, and so in order to put him on her health insurance policy, they got married kind of quietly and actually weren't telling people because they still wanted to be able to have that big wedding, but. I mean, I don't fault them for that. They just wanted to be able to invite their friends, and they couldn't afford it. And and so she she suddenly started thinking of herself as a breadwinner, and she found it unsettling and scary to know that their that their household depended alone on her earnings. And she found that she started working a lot harder, even harder at work, to make sure that she kept her job. And she started volunteering for travel. Whenever you know, raising her hand whenever they called to show how gung ho she was, and she found herself asking. So every time I I sign up for travel, do I need to call him and ask him if that's okay, or can I just sign up? I mean, what do I owe now that I'm the breadwinner, and I'm, am I entitled to do that, or or do I owe it to him to ask him? And she did find herself signing up for、um, travel sometimes without asking because she figured she was entitled. And and at the same time, because she was working so hard, she found that her performance evaluations were improving. And so she was also, I think, benefiting from the satisfaction of being the breadwinner、um, because she was feeling that earning pressure that remember they thought men used to need to have to feel in order to be sober and industrious.、Uh, and so as she was getting increasingly sober and industrious.、Um, <laughs> Michael was actually being very industrious at home, and he said to me, "He said, 'You know, I need to prove that I'm still valuable.' And so he was doing all the cooking, he was doing all the cleaning, he was doing all the cat litter box changing, and."、Um, And and he was you know you go back to the idea of the deal I mean he was very aware that you need to bring something into a relationship besides love and and compassion and he felt he needed to show his value to his wife so and also he's a really good cook and he's sort of a neat neck and so it it he was I think more prone to to actually do the housework not hapless at all and and then eventually what happened is he did get another job but he was making half as much as she was and so what she said to me when I talked to her again is. Does it have to be fifty-fifty when I come home? I mean, I'm earning more than he is. So, <laughs> so when I come home, I mean, he is cooking more than I do, and you know, and and he's a be- he's a better cook. Now, this is what this is what men used to argue, right? You know, you're a better loader of the dishwasher, so、um, shouldn't you be loading the dishwasher? And she found herself saying the same thing. Well, he's actually better at cleaning, and he's better at cooking. So, you know, maybe this is okay. Maybe it's okay that. 
I'm earning more and he's doing more, even though feminism, I think, has brought us up to think that that's not okay. You know, that male breadwinners, it didn't buy you out of sorting socks or changing diapers. That's what we've been arguing. And, and the other thing that she found that I thought was very interesting is she admitted, and a number of women have admitted this to me, that she felt a secret sort of proprietary right to her earnings. And studies do show that when women become breadwinners, they are more likely than male breadwinners to make the household finance and purchasing decisions. That male breadwinners have traditionally handed over that pay packet, or most of that pay packet, and said, you know, honey, here it is, spend it on the household. They thought of themselves as providers, but I think women have been raised to think of our earnings like as our pin money, and as our, you know, our shoe money, or whatever it is that we want or need or think that we need. And and, and so to make that leap, to think of yourself as the provider, even though she was working her way toward that, was still hard. And when he, he would take their cats to the vet and he okayed a, a, a like, you know, an expensive vet bill for a procedure. And she said, um, she had the secret thought, you just spent a bunch of my money without asking me. <laughs> and, and, and she acknowledged that this was the wrong thought, but that... If, and she said, you know, if it had been his money, if he had been earning, I would have thought, okay, you just spent a bunch of money on our cat, whatever. But somehow the fact that it was her, it, she was still thinking of it, it, it as her money. And, and I have to confess that, you know, this does, I think, give credence to what the London Times was arguing, maybe, that, um, that the idea, you know, she wasn't lording it over him, but she was still maybe feeling a little bit more entitled. And I had a number of women who think of themselves as really egalitarian and really progressive, admitting to sort of secret spasms of thinking of this as my money rather than our money. And I think that that is, um, you know, as we move into this new uh, new social order, this is something that women are going to have to think through in, in a new way. Do, does entitlement come with breadwinning? We'd like to think not, but um, if so, I mean, what, if not, what are some things that we can do to, uh, to ameliorate any tensions? And I think, um, I mean, one, one thing that women definitely need to do is, is when they are the providers, they need to think of themselves as providers. And, and something that came up often when I was talking to women is they said, um, you know, I worry that he feels emasculated because he has to ask me for money. And I would think, well, why is he asking you for money? Of course that's emasculating. And, and why don't you have an ATM machine? And I was surprised, I mean, why don't you have a joint checking account and an ATM machine and you both have your own card and why is anybody asking anybody for money? And I do think it, it, it gets back to the, this notion that this is my money somehow. And, and so one thing that women need to do going forward is to, um, is to, embrace the notion that you are a provider. Um, so I think uh, while I, I reject the idea that women become unpleasant wives when they have their own earnings, I do think that we're in the middle of kind of a shift in thinking uh, that, um, that, that do, does raise sort of new tensions and new questions that are interesting. The idea, though, that women um, can, can go where they like and do what they please, or the idea that they might actually leave marriage is also, I would, I would think, true. I mean, I would argue it's definitely true. And one of the reasons that we've seen declines in marriage rates in this country is because women can either leave unhappy marriages um, or, or not enter into a marriage that seems like it will be unsatisfactory. And, and uh, for, we certainly see that, um, you know, part of the reason why women are becoming economically dominant in some relationship is because of changes in the economy, moving from an industrial economy where a male high school graduate could expect a high, could reasonably expect a high paying industrial job. We know that those are waning and that it's becoming a knowledge economy where it's more important than ever to have a college education. And we know that women in the working class are often making the decision not to marry at all because they figure I can support myself, I can support a child, but I don't want to support another dependent. If it looks like um, the men in their marriage pool have, um, have poor economic prospects, they won't get married. Um, and so I do think that, that the idea that there is an, an economic aspect to marriage and that an economic bond is, is part of it, and then that marriage will change when women have earnings is true, and we're seeing that borne out. And, and I think um, a number of the women that I, that I interviewed had been married or partnered to men who found this um, problematic. And, and I, I, 
and where retentions came up because the man was threatened by it. And I interviewed a woman who was a very high-earning, high very high-earning in Texas, which is um, a tough state for female earners, I must say. Uh, and and uh, she, she got into a relationship where she was um, already very high-earning. She married a man who was... Uh, lower earning than she was working as as a salesman and doing okay, but she had really a quite high income and she was fine with that um, and very happy to have a companion and a partner and a life partner to travel with and to go to restaurants with. She she wasn't interested in having children, but she was very interested in having a companion and didn't care who made the earnings. And so they would travel. Uh, they both liked to play golf. They would travel to Europe. And um, and it, it became apparent to her that he was increasingly bothered by the situation and that his self-esteem was suffering and he was becoming retaliatory and he was becoming sexually uninterested in her. He was becoming quite interested in other women. So she said, you know, whenever we would go to a restaurant, I couldn't... Um, you know, he was gawking and flirting, and uh, and and she eventually discovered um, a case of porn on his um, on his computer and realized that you know she was not the wife that he was comfortable with, and there was a different model of femininity that he was comfortable with, and it became more and more painful to her. And there were control issues, and um, eventually, you know, the sort of bizarre arguments that you have in marriage. She wanted to get a dog. He didn't want her to get a dog. She he thought she would spend too much time on the dog and her work, and and uh, and so she got the dog. And finally, there was so much wrangling that she looked at him and she said, "You know what?" I'm going to keep the dog and I'm going to get rid of you. <laughs> and that's what she did. And, and so I think, you know, <laughs> economists, um, economists refer to this as the independence effect, which is, that, uh, which is that when you are economically empowered in a relationship, you also economically empowered to leave the relationship. And so I think it's fair to argue that, uh, and, I, and I, did, I did interview a number of women who said versions of the same thing. It was much easier to dump him because I didn't rely on him financially. And incidentally, you know, when, when people wonder why women are attending college in higher numbers than men, I interviewed a number of young women who I would say would be in, in, in the working class or also in traditional communities. I interviewed a number of young Latina women in Texas, and they would say to me explicitly, you know, I saw my mom and I saw how she suffered in her marriage, and I saw the fact that she couldn't afford to leave her marriage because she was economically so inferior to my dad, and I resolved that I would never be in that situation. And one of the things that's propelling, I think, young women into college is the notion that they need actually to be independent in marriage. They need to be able to support themselves at a certain point. And, and I think women have assumed that, rightly so, that um, in order to make even as much as a man, they need more education. And this has historically been true, and it is still true, although the gap is closing, that a college education for a woman doesn't earn you as much as it does for a man. And so I saw I saw young women who explicitly talked about watching their mothers either suffer in marriage, and actually I talked to young men who had seen the same thing, or mothers who got divorced and, and suffered a, a real drop in their, um, in their stand of living because they had not been earning. So I think this awareness that it's important, this idea of the independence effect, the idea that it's important to have earnings in marriage, um, is very much on young women's minds. And I think one of the reasons for the current disparity is that in many working class communities, boys actually, they think of themselves as providers. They are still living in a world where you could leave high school and get a decent paying industrial job. And so they're leaving after high school to get a job in order to be able to support themselves or a family. The girls are staying in school. They're emerging better equipped to provide. And in many cases, girls are getting financial help from their families that boys actually aren't getting. And, and, and girls are hearing this message from their parents, you've got to be able to support yourself at some point, and therefore you've got to stay in school. And studies have shown that girls Girls actually get more financial help from their parents in college than boys do. So there's this mixed message, I think, for teenagers and kids in their 20s um, that, that has to do with all sorts of things. Boys think of themselves as providers, leaving the workplace to take jobs that aren't there anymore. Girls thinking that, okay, I need to at least be independent so I don't have to live the life that my mother did, going to college and therefore emerging better equipped in this knowledge economy.
But I would, I would argue ultimately that, um, that we are a very adaptive species. And one of the most interesting things in reporting this book is seeing the adaptations that um, particularly young women who are graduating from college into this world where, uh, where they are better educated than the men in their, in their dating and marriage pool. And so it's not, no longer possible for every female college graduate to marry a male college graduate because there aren't enough to go around. And this is really unprecedented. And so young women have to ask themselves now, would I marry a guy who didn't go to college? And this is really a new question, and women really do ask it. Because when I would ask this of young women, they would say, you know, I was just talking about that with my friends out you know, at a restaurant the other night. And one of them said, you know, I just decided it's a deal breaker. I've tried it and it didn't work. You know, I couldn't talk to him. And what what you see is a lot of, you do see a still a fair amount of skepticism among young women um, at the idea of marrying down academically. They see education as a proxy for drive and ambition and the ability to hold a conversation. And so at least initially the women I talked to were often skeptical of this idea. So one adaptation that I saw of young women in big cities is that they're traveling and they're jumping on, train, on planes and going to different cities as a means of enlarging their dating pool. And I interviewed a young woman in, I, really, I interviewed a young woman in Miami, which is high among the cities where young women out or young men. She was a senior at, at her university. She was earning 70,000 a year directing the social networking, because I guess, you know, the older administrators don't understand how it works. And so you need like a 20 year old to manage your college's social networking. So she had all this money. She, she didn't see any, well, like many, her, her college is majority female, as many colleges are now, and she was in marketing, which is even more majority female, so she was having trouble finding guys locally, and so she goes to New York all the time because she can get cheap airfare. And so she, she and her friends go to this one place in New York called the Ace Hotel that's like this techie, it's got this techie bar where people socialize with their laptops open, which doesn't really sound like that fun to me, but apparently she thought it was great. So one adaptation for young women is going to be traveling to try to enlarge that mating pool, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and she would also go to San Francisco and Seattle. Uh, and, and, but another... Um, Another adaptation that I saw actually is women changing their mind about this and understanding that, you know, maybe it, in the long run it actually is a good thing if you want to really succeed in your workplace and rise to have a spouse who is willing to take, a, you know, a supportive role. And so I interviewed a young woman in Vermont who's in law school, is married to her high school sweetheart, and he's a carpenter, uh, was working as an auto mechanic in Vermont to put her through law school. He was doing for her what wives traditionally do for husbands, what wives traditionally did for husbands. He was putting her through law school so she could in, expand her earning potential and, and ultimately would be the primary earner in their household. She was fine with that. She loved him for all these supportive qualities, for the fact that he was um, supporting her career, that he was doing, you know, as much housework as she was, and the fact that she could get home at the end of the day and not have to talk about law and, and be able to leave that competitive law school environment and interact with somebody who's not a competitive law student who's competing with her. And, and, and I think one of the things I see is couples, you know, we have this idea that we want to match the person that we partner with, if we partner, and, and traditionally we have wanted and still want somebody who has our same education level. I mean, that's really been the trend of the past 30 or 40 years. A college graduate wants to marry a college graduate, um, and what actually is one of the things that's driving income inequality in our country, because you have these college graduates marrying and people who didn't go to college probably not marrying, um, and, and so, you, the twain gets farther and farther apart from each other. Um, but she was, where she and her husband were matching was in uh, leisure pursuits. They both like hiking and they both like being outdoors. And so they have this whole other realm that doesn't have to do with work and doesn't have to do with um, academics where they could match. And I think we'll see more and more of that. Um, but what you also see talking to young women is um, getting their minds around the fact that they are going to be the primary breadwinner going forward. And one of the things that we've seen in terms of men's adaptations is that men, when, they, when they're asked to name uh, attractive traits in a potential mate, 
Domestic skills has plummeted in the past 40 years. Earning prospects has risen enormously. So men are getting it. They understand that to, you know that it's a good thing in an economic climate to have a wife who can earn. And you see more and more young men who are willing to invest in in their girlfriend's potential or their wife's potential if she has the higher earning potential. So I talked to a young woman in Atlanta who um, who is an engineering student, and so was her. Uh, boyfriend, but he was sort of getting discouraged. He had a really tough thesis advisor. She had had some really lucrative internships. And he was saying to her, you know, I'll put my bets on you. I'll, I'll put my chips on you. If, you, if you're going to get a job in California, I'll move for you. And this, incidentally, is really important for women in the workplace, because traditionally, husbands have not been willing to move for wives. Now they increasingly are. And this, I think, is one of the things that will help propel women up. If, if bosses see that you have a supportive spouse who will make um, you know, compromises for you and for your career, this is going to give women more value in the workplace. And I think it's part of what will help us break through the glass ceiling, which still exists. So, but she was having to get her mind around this. And she said to me at one point, you know, getting boxed in as the higher earner sounds to me like a lot more work and a lot less play. So she too was having to absorb the kind of future that men used to look at when you're looking down the road and you know you want to be an involved parent and and really still trying to get her head around that. So it will be interesting to see the choices that women make now that they're moving into this completely reconfigured future. Um, I, I, another wonderful adaptation, though, that I saw a, a young woman in, in, um, in South Texas. I spent a lot of time with some Latina women in a community there. In the, Latin, in the Latino community, women are academically achieving at even higher rates than men, in part, I think, because of the provider ethos among the young men. And so these women are graduating into a world where they are significantly more educated than the men in their marriage pool. And most of these women didn't want to travel because they're very rooted to that area and they have extended families there. So she married her high school sweetheart. She went to college. He had dropped out. And she made him go to college. And, and, and that actually came up a number of times in conversations. And I should say, in her case, it was more of being an inspiration, being encouragement and inspiring him. He had dropped out in part because he had to get a job. His parents weren't helping him. And she really set, I think, a standard for him and facilitated his education. And I'd like to think going forward that this might be one solution to sort of getting more guys in school. I mean, it, it's hard. And some women did say, you know, it is kind of like having a third child as I, you know, like sign him up with the registrar's office. But I think, you know, <laughs> when it works, it, it actually really works well. So, um, so these are all interesting adaptations I have seen to this new world order. But I would also like to point out that I interviewed many, many husbands and wives where the, the the wife because she was just a managerial type, an extrovert because she loved the workforce, you know, where the wife was emerging as the breadwinner in the family, where the husbands were able to dial it back and spend more time with their children, which we know is something that fathers want. Fathers want today more time with their children than they could have 30 or 40 years ago, um, or even maybe 150 years ago. And, and, and they're getting it, and they're taking it. And so I interviewed any number of very happy couples where they were able to make decisions on who was going to be the primary earner, who was going to be the supportive, um, you know, stay at home, or secondary earner, the one who took the kids to the lessons and, and cooked the meals. Um, and, and, and they were able to make those decisions based on affinity rather than any kind of gender stereotype. And so I ultimately feel as though, I mean, to me it's a no-brainer that it's a good thing for women to be economically empowered in their relationships. It gives you all sorts of of, of new freedoms, in a, it, even as it introduces new stresses and, and new, new questions. And, and for men also, my reporting you know, bore out that, that there's a liberation that comes with not being expected to be the primary breadwinner, to being able to have different options in life, maybe to be the secondary earner for a while while you, look, while you figure out what the career is that you really want to do. And, and that, that we're moving toward a new world order where there's much more flexibility for men and for women. And um, actually, and my favorite anecdote is, is a woman in Michigan who, um, whose husband is, it, well, 
is also very empowered. It's very important for the husbands to be empowered. And, and her, her husband is the CFO of the household. He makes you know, the financial decisions. She really respects his, um, his decision making. He's a great cook. And he's also a great bartender. And so when she's, has, when she's had a really bad day at the office, she texts red, just the word red. And he has a glass of red wine waiting for her at the end of the day. And um, so you know, he's bringing those. Um, bringing that to the marriage. And one day she had had a really hard day and uh, she staggered into the house and, and started just talking to him, talking to him about the day. And he said, did you, did you look outside when you came in? And he had, um, he had made her a margarita and he had put it on the, um, on the front stoop with a sign that said, drink before entering. <laughs> and so I have this idea that Every woman in the world is going to like, or every woman who reads this is going to turn to her partner and say, you know, you want to know what women want? <laughs> I'll give you one good answer. Um, a margarita on the doorstep. Uh, so um, I, I would like to conclude with the idea that economic empowerment um, makes women actually happier partners and makes them more benevolent and less resentful. And so um, having begun with the London Times, I would like to conclude with Virginia Woolf. And, and I would urge you all to go back and read A Room of One's Own because I had forgotten that it's really an essay about money, and it's an essay about how women have been deprived for so long of the kind of resources that would enable them to establish universities, you know, to build an educational system that one, women, one, one reason women had not achieved artistically and in terms of literature is because they couldn't go to college, you know, because they couldn't go to universities. And she really talks about the importance of economic empowerment. Uh, she creates this character um, sort of like her, who had gotten started on a writing career and was so dependent on the little income that she felt that she had to sort of bend her words to, um, you know, to please her male editors or to please her male readers. And she writes about getting a bequest from an aunt that enabled her to become self-supporting, that enabled her not to have to bend her words and not to have to depend on, um, you know, the pittance she would get for sort of writing what would please uh, uh, maybe her male editor. And she talked about how this made her a happier person and how it made her feel more benevolent and less resentful. And she wrote, um, I need not hate any man. He cannot hurt me. I need not flatter any man. He has nothing to give me. So imperceptibly, I found myself adopting a new attitude toward the other half of the human race. Um, and I think that is a much more um, hopeful and a much more accurate uh, description of, of what happens when women do have some earnings of their own, and, and I feel like we're moving into um, a very happy new world order. Thank you. How have you seen the recent economic recession and depression that's impacted all of us across the country impact relationships? The recession illuminated this trend that's been happening of the, 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 you know, the, the waning of industrial jobs. Uh, three quarters of the jobs lost during the recession were men's jobs. And, and, and I interviewed a lot of women who had been stay-at-home moms who took jobs um, when their husbands lost work. I spent a lot of time in Michigan doing those interviews. And one thing that I think it's really important to, um, to remember is that you know, they talk about the end of men and the decline of men. And it's, it's really important to remember that women didn't cause the decline of men. I would argue that in this recession, women prevented men from declining further in the sense that these jobs were going away anyway. And that because men had working wives or working girlfriends or women in their wives who, who were you know, in some cases already working but able to ramp it up, move from a part-time job to a full-time job, or move from being stay-at-home to being in the workforce, and maybe they had worked before, that that really kept households afloat in a way that we have not appreciated. And all the statistics show that during the recession, the amount of money that working wives contribute to their households really jumped, that, that women in many cases were keeping households afloat. I found, and I think, you know, compared to the Depression, and I talked to economists about this, like Betsy Stevenson, um, who's a, a, a prominent economist and was at the Department of Labor, thinking about, you know, during the recession, well, women actually lost jobs during, during the Depression. Women 
couldn't move into jobs that would enable them to keep the households afloat. I mean, in many cases, actually, women who were working were fired first in the Depression because men were regarded as the wage earners. But what we have now is a sufficient number of women who either have worked or are working that they could ramp it up and they could really keep these households going. And what you see in studies, there's a sociological study that was presented last year, is that men recognized this and that they were very grateful for it. I mean, that they, they appreciated the value of it and, and were actually finding ways in the household to show their thanks. Um, and, and so the women that I interviewed in Michigan, I think that, you know, I felt like they were being pretty stoic. About, I mean, they were being stoic and good humored about it. They understood that, you know, that this was expected of them. They didn't blame their husbands. For having lost their jobs, and 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 we're stepping forward, and and and. I mean, one woman who had been a stay-at-home mom who I interviewed, and her, her husband had lost his job, and he was a stay-at-home dad, and it really didn't suit either of them. And she said, you know, he had my life, and I wanted it back. And, and even though she was uh, working and earning, she was probably the least happy of the women that I interviewed because she had enjoyed being a, a stay-at-home mom. Right? She, actually, she had been working part-time for her children. But in general, I felt as though... I was interviewing couples where the husbands had been out of work for a year, a year and a half, and I felt like they were really holding up well, that the women understood that this was part of being married. And, and actually, most of the time when I checked back in with them a year later, even if the men had got, had, were reemployed, and most of them were, the women were still working uh, because, they, because the household finances were so depleted that they, that they felt they couldn't go back to being stay-at-home moms. And, and, and in, actually, one woman I interviewed, she, she talked about what it felt like her husband was was now stay at home and he was starting a career as an independent consultant and she said she she it was so meaningful even as she missed being the one in charge of the household it was so meaningful to her to see him be, be able to spend more time with their children and 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 she actually teared up every time she talked about this she said he had worked so hard for so long and now my boys were really able to spend so much time with their dad and she watched herself she said at the end of the year they came home with all their artwork and I wasn't in a single picture, you know, and, and, and it was all them and their dad. And at the same time, she would joke about how I got dissed in the artwork, you know. <laughs> and yet it, it meant a lot to her that, her that her husband was now in those pictures. So I think that was a good example of the conflicting emotions that women were feeling. Do you think that the recent trends nationally toward taking um, women's rights away in healthcare and control over our own bodies has anything to do with this new social order you're talking about, perhaps a reaction to it? I'm so glad you asked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I think part of it is, uh, part of the, the contraception um, kerfluffle uh, is an attempt to get at Obamacare in any way. But I think what's interesting is, is when you look at the reasons why women really upped their college going in the 1970s and 80s, in part it was because college campuses opened that hadn't been open. But economists have shown that the entrance of the pill and reliable contraception onto the landscape gave women the message that they could invest in their educations and they could expect to have a career and that it wouldn't be as likely to be interrupted by an unplanned pregnancy. So there's, there's an economist, Har Claudia Golden at Harvard, who's shown this and others, that it was a major factor in changing women's strategic planning. They, they knew that it was worthwhile to invest in a career, so they began going to college in higher numbers. They began going to graduate school in higher numbers because they knew they could, they could plan their families and they could have a career that wouldn't be interrupted and there's even a study showing that to the extent that the gender wage gap has narrowed that 25 percent of that can be attributed to the pill and and so i think it is perhaps no accident that um that this whole bizarre contraception discussion if it's, not, if it's an accident, it's still quite interesting that it's happening at a time when women are more economically empowered than they've ever been before. You know, it's interesting. Women are now, you know, half of law students, and there are some people who project that law could become a really effeminized profession the way that some other professions have. And it was just interesting to me that it was a law student who was singled out um, by Rush Limbaugh. I don't know. That probably is an accident. But I do think there, um, there are, yeah, I, I don't think it's... I don't, I don't think it's all accidental. I've, I'm seeing an, a trend happening in dating where um, if I'm going out to eat and I feel like I want to be treated like a lady and uh, you know I'm not reaching for my wallet, it's an issue. And um, I do have a great job. Yeah. 
And um, I would still like to embrace some of these, I guess, more traditional roles. Is that something you feel like women like myself are going to have to give up in the near future? Because <laughs> <laughs> you're shaking your head. Yeah. <laughs> Pay for my own food? Got it. <laughs> but, yeah. but not completely. I mean, I think it depends on, you know, and I, this came up so often when I was talking to women who were dating, and, and, and I would talk to women who would hide their earnings, and they, would, they had all these little strategies to sort of minimize their affluence. Like one woman, one woman um, young woman would carry around a lot of ones and fives and tens, you know, petty cash. <laughs> So that she could, she could, she, she would pay, but she could pay for tipping and drinks and parking without having it seem like she was paying. And I felt like there was another woman who would, actually these women were willing to pay, but they were trying to kind of minimize its impact on their apparent femininity, I guess. And, and so she would buy movie tickets in advance and then say they were being given away at work. Uh, so that's what she would tell her boyfriend. And I interviewed a number of women who would lie about what they do when they were meeting men in bars. I interviewed a, a university vice president who would say that she worked in administration, admissions. Um, and, and, you know, or at the university, I interviewed a doctor in Pittsburgh who say, well, I, I work at the hospital taking care of patients. So, um, you know, really, to, I was very surprised because, um, yeah, I, I was surprised at the number of women who would really, and, and I think they were afraid that they would send signals that would say, I'm not needy, I don't need you, I'm independent, I'm scary, or something. I mean, they were really trying to figure out how to present themselves. Uh, and so, I, and I, but I, I think that, I mean, there are other, women find other ways, I think, also to preserve this traditional sort of courtly sense. I mean, for example, one of the high earning women, she owned the car, her boyfriend didn't have a car, but when they went on dates, she liked him to drive. And, and even though it seems laughable, I do think, um, you know, there are different qualities of masculinity and paying is one thing, but there's, you know, protection, the idea of pr protecting and being protected, I think is something that women still find comforting. And, and for example, like in these, these couples in Michigan, the men I noticed do a lot of putting on of the women's coats. And, and the, I remember when I was doing the interviewing, they were very, um, they would put on my coat for me. And I actually thought it was quite nice and polite and, 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 and pleasant. So I think people are couples are finding other ways to maintain what does seem to be kind of an important ingredient in, in a romantic relationship. Uh, there was a big splash during the Republican um, primaries when uh, Michelle Bachman, um, you know, first promoted uh, the biblical vow of marriage and then had to completely basically reinterpret and abandon um, that interpretation. Um, for survival purposes, and I'm wondering, in, did you find in your interviews that basically the old-fashioned religious view of the vow has completely gone, or are there some parts of the country where it's alive? Or you're talking about, you know, sort of fundamentalist religions where it's still taught that the that the wife should be submissive because there are a couple of places in the Bible where the idea that the wife should submit to her husband is stated. And so, um, I mean, there are a number of traditional religions where it's explicitly taught that the husband is the household leader, that the wife should be submissive, and or that the husband is the household provider. I mean, I interviewed a Mormon wife who has the proclamation on the family actually hanging in her mudroom, and it says explicitly, that home is the wife's domain and that the, that the husband should be the provider. And she sort of like, you know, laughed about it and just said that they ignore it because she earns twice as much as her husband and he's actually not Mormon and she says she forbids him to, but anyway. Um, but but what, I, what, what Michelle Bachman had said earlier is interesting. She had said, um, oh, talking about the idea of submission, that um, th so... The reason I went to law, into to law school and became a tax lawyer, even though I hate taxes, is because my husband said that that's what I should do. And, and so I'm still a submissive wife. And I do find, you know, in many church communities now, women are higher educated than the men in the congregation. And I read blogs, you know, where women were talking about this. And one of the women specifically said, our pastor directed that I should be the earner. And, and, and so that there's this kind of loophole, essentially, that, um, that you could still be submissive if you're going forth and doing the earning. And, and I don't mean to criticize the religions, but, but it is a real, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance, I think, 
if you're, um, you know, in a believing congregation and yet you're the one that's doing the earning and, and that needs to be sorted out. And I think it can add to stigma and unhappiness, actually. And, and stigma is, is not to be underestimated. The social function of marriage, the social policy behind marriage, and specifically with reference to the question of whether there's anything left to the idea that there should be a woman in every marriage. Because, you know, marriage had this function... Yeah. No, a, a woman of some sort, you know, because marriage had this function of supporting women for such a long time, and it was always thought, and it still may be thought, that women bring generally something special to marriages. And now, um, well, maybe that's gone. So what, what, what do you think's happening to, to marriages with regard, you know, specifically with uh, respect to the role of, of a woman in marriage? Do, do, do we need marriages to help women? Do we need marriages, uh, do we need women in marriages to help men? Um, should essentially, it's a question that touches on the issue of whether or not there should be same-sex marriages, but specifically with reference to um, how society might benefit from there being complementary partners in a marriage. Yeah, the, the, I, I'm not sure if you're asking that, you know, there's this great feminist essay from long ago called I Want a Wife, you know, the idea that everybody, if they're working, needs somebody supportive at home. And I'm not sure if you're asking whether every marriage needs a woman in it, um, because I don't think that it necessarily does. Uh, but, um, but the idea that every marriage needs a wife in the sense that there could be one primary partner and one supportive partner, um, I think is, is a notion that that feminism has rejected in, in our you know, emphasis on exact equality and parity and, and we're just married to a person who's the opposite gender version of us. Um, and I do think that, that what we see in these, in these successful relationships is if you wanna have children, it often does become very difficult if you're both moving ahead at the same pace. And, and, and couples do calibrate. And, and increasingly, I would argue, you know, it can be the woman who's advancing and the husband who's calibrating back. And, and I, I think, you know, when we talk about, there is still a gender wage gap. You know, women still are unrepresented at the highest, underrepresented at the highest echelons of corporate America. And, and that, Really, in order to get to the top, yes, the workplace can change, and yes, there should be more maternity leave and more paternity leave and more reasonable hours, but I think we also have to recognize that if you really want to reach those top echelons, you are going to need a wife at home in the sense that you are going to need a supportive spouse who maybe is going to be the secondary earner, and we can't expect the workplace to do it all. I mean, that may be uh, anathema to, to, to many people to hear, but you know, there was this, there was this economist, Gary Becker, who made this argument back in the 1970s and 80s about specialization in a marriage, that it's more efficient if one spouse is the worker and one spouse is you know, the household person. And this was rejected as being anti-feminist because it was just going to keep women in aprons forever um, and 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 the model was you know to go forward and expect equality but I think we I think in some cases we're gonna see that a specialization model actually has its advantages both at home and for women in the workplace so I don't know if that's a, that's an um, exact answer to your question but that's certainly what what I'm seeing thank you so much <laughs> <laughs>